I've always seen the Netherlands as a land defined by struggle, a low country, perpetually at war with the sea, and a historical crossroads, trampled by nearly every major empire in European history. Romans, Franks, Vikings, Spaniards, French, German Saul have marched across these flat, open fields. Logically, the DNA of the Dutch people should be a chaotic soup, a complete mix of a dozen different ancestries. But when scientists finally decoded their genome, they found something that defied all expectations. A genetic signature of shocking stability. A story not of constant change, but of incredible, almost impossible endurance. How did a people living on Europe's most contested piece of real estate create a genetic fortress that would stand for millennia? The answer lies buried in their bones, written in their blood, and hidden in the most unexpected places. To understand the strength of this fortress, we first have to see the land before it was built. Our story begins not with the Dutch, but with the ghosts who walked this land before them. 300,000 years ago, Neanderthals hunted mammoths in what would become the Netherlands. Archaeological evidence from sites like Maastricht shows they weren't just surviving, they were thriving. They had sophisticated tools, controlled fire, and left behind the first human footprints in this marshy landscape. But around 40,000 years ago, something changed. The first modern humans arrived the original European hunter-gatherers. These weren't primitive savages. They were master craftsmen, creating intricate bone carvings and sophisticated hunting implements. They carried the ancient Y-DNA lineage I-2, a signature that whispers of a time when all of Europe was a wild, untamed frontier. For over 30,000 years, they were the sole inhabitants, the first people of the Low Countries. Generation after generation, they adapted to the changing landscape as ice ages came and went. They survived the great floods, the volcanic winters, the mass extinctions that wiped out the megafauna. But here's the mystery. When we look at the DNA of the modern Dutch, this ancient lineage is barely a trace, less than 3% of the population. It's as if these first people, who survived everything nature could throw at them, simply vanished. So what happened to them? The answer lies in the arrival of the first group that would test and begin to build the fortress. Around 7,000 years ago, the first great wave of change arrived from the southeast. These were the Neolithic farmers, carrying genes that traced back to Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. They brought with them a revolutionary technology, agriculture. In much of Europe, their arrival meant a violent replacement of the local hunter-gatherers. Genetic studies from Germany and Britain show a pattern of near-complete population replacement. The farmers didn't just take the land, they replaced the people entirely. But in the wetlands of the Netherlands, something completely different happened. We see it in the unique Swifterbank culture, discovered along the shores of ancient lakes. Here, the ancient hunter-gatherers didn't disappear. They met the newcomers. They traded, they learned, and they integrated. Ancient DNA from this period is remarkable. Some individuals are pure hunter-gatherer, others are 60% farmer, and some are a near-perfect mix. But this wasn't random intermarriage. The genetic evidence shows careful, deliberate integration. Hunter-gatherer men were marrying farmer women. Farmer men were adopting hunter-gatherer territories. This wasn't a conquest. It was Europe's first great cultural and genetic synthesis. The ancient I-2 lineage of the hunters wasn't erased. It was woven into a new tapestry alongside the farmers' G2A and J2 lines. The foundation of the fortress was laid, built on a principle of absorption, not replacement. But this peaceful integration created something unexpected. The hybrid population wasn't just genetically diverse, it was genetically innovative. They developed new technologies, new social structures, and most importantly, new survival strategies that would serve them for millennia. The foundation of the fortress was laid, but the greatest genetic transformation in Dutch history was yet to come. Around 4,500 years ago, a new people thundered into Europe from the vast Eurasian steppe. This was not a gentle synthesis. This was a demographic revolution that would reshape the continent forever. They were the Bell Beaker people, named for their distinctive pottery, 
but they were so much more than potters. They brought with them advanced metalworking, the first bronze weapons and tools. They brought the horse, transforming warfare and transportation. They brought Indo-European languages that would become the ancestors of most European tongues. And they brought a new genetic signature that would come to define the Netherlands, the Y-DNA haplogroup R1b. This wasn't just another migration, it was a genetic tsunami. But here's where the story gets fascinating. Genetic studies show that this migration was a fundamental shift across Northern Europe. Over 90% of the existing male lineages were replaced by this new R1b line. In Britain, in Germany, in France, the genetic landscape was completely transformed. In the Netherlands, a specific branch, R1bu106, became dominant, but the replacement wasn't total. The Bell Beaker people didn't just conquer, they absorbed. The careful synthesis that had begun with the farmers and hunters continued. The newcomers took the best of what they found and integrated it into their own genetic and cultural matrix. This was the moment the code was written. The fusion of the absorbed hunter-gatherers, the integrated Neolithic farmers, and this new dominant steppe lineage created the core of the Dutch genome. Bronze Age settlements show a society that was both hierarchical and inclusive, warlike and innovative. Archaeological evidence from this period is stunning. Elaborate burial mounds, sophisticated bronze weapons, and most tellingly, evidence of long-distance trade networks. These people weren't just survivors, they were connectors, traders, innovators. They had forged something new from the genetic raw materials of three ancient peoples. And from this moment on, something extraordinary happens. The fortress is sealed. I always assumed that the story of Dutch DNA would be one of constant change. After all, the Netherlands sits at the mouth of three major river systems, the Rhine, the Meuse, and the Scheldt. It's a natural highway into the heart of Europe. Every army, every trader, every migrant group would pass through here. But the real twist is the opposite. After the Bellbeaker transformation, the Dutch gene pool became incredibly resilient. From this point forward, every subsequent invader, every empire, every great historical upheaval would break against this genetic fortress, leaving a cultural mark but barely a genetic scratch. The story of Dutch DNA isn't one of constant mixing. It's the story of one major forging, followed by 4,000 years of uncanny stability. But why? What made this particular genetic combination so resistant to change? The answer lies in what geneticists call founder effects and genetic bottlenecks. The Bell Beaker synthesis had created a population that was both genetically diverse and culturally cohesive. They had the adaptive advantages of multiple ancestries, but the social unity of a shared identity. More importantly, they had developed survival strategies that went beyond genetics. They created social structures that could absorb newcomers without losing their core identity. They developed technologies that made them valuable as allies rather than targets for replacement. And they occupied a landscape that rewarded cooperation over conquest. But theory is one thing. The real test would come when the greatest empires in history set their sights on this small, flat country. And now, we can test that fortress against the mightiest powers the world had ever seen. In 57 BCE, Julius Caesar's legions crossed the Rhine and entered the Netherlands. They found a land divided among fierce tribes, the Batavi, the Cananifates, the Frisii. These weren't primitive barbarians, they were sophisticated warriors and traders who had been dealing with Romans for generations. The Romans conquered the southern Netherlands, built cities like Nijmegen and Maastricht, and ruled for over 400 years. Their empire was a cosmopolitan melting pot. Roman soldiers came from across the Mediterranean, Italians, Greeks, Spaniards, North Africans. They built roads, temples, and bathhouses. They brought wine, olive oil, and Roman law and they intermarried with the locals. Archaeological evidence shows Roman soldiers marrying local women, local elites adopting Roman customs, and a gradual Romanization of the population. For four centuries, the Netherlands was part of the Roman world. You would expect this to leave a massive genetic legacy, 
And indeed, we do see traces of their Mediterranean DNA in modern Dutch people, about 4.5% E1B1B and 6% J2. But here's the crucial detail. It's mostly concentrated in old Roman cities and trading posts. When researchers analyzed rural populations, the farmers, the fishermen, the vast majority of the people, the Roman genetic signature virtually disappears. The Roman cities were like genetic islands in a sea of unchanged Dutch DNA. How is this possible? The answer lies in Roman colonial strategy. Romans didn't replace populations, they ruled through local elites. They built cities but left the countryside largely untouched. Most importantly, Roman identity was cultural, not genetic. You became Roman by adopting Roman customs, not by being born Roman. The fortress held. But the Romans were just the beginning. The real test would come from the sea. For two centuries, from 800 to 1000 CE, the longships came. Viking raiders swept down from Scandinavia, their dragon-proud vessels appearing like phantoms on the Dutch coast. They weren't just raiders, they were traders, explorers, and eventually, settlers. The Vikings established bases in Frisia, married into local families, and created trade networks that stretched from Greenland to Constantinople. Archaeological evidence shows extensive Viking presence, sword hordes, jewelry, and even entire settlements. Some historians argue that the Viking impact on the Netherlands was profound. They introduced new technologies, new trade routes, and new cultural practices. The Frisian language shows clear Norse influences. Place names across the country reflect Viking settlement patterns. But when geneticists analyzed the Y chromosome data, they found something surprising. The Scandinavian genetic signature in the Dutch population is modest and highly localized. It's strongest in coastal areas, particularly in Frisia, but even there it represents only 5 to 8 percent of the population. Why so little genetic impact from such a visible cultural presence? The answer lies in the nature of Viking activity. The raids were carried out by young men seeking wealth and adventure. Most returned home. Those who stayed were usually traders or craftsmen who integrated into existing communities. Moreover, the Vikings who settled in the Netherlands often came as individuals or small groups, not as conquering armies. They married into local families, adopted local customs, and within a generation or two, their genetic signature was diluted into the existing population. The fortress held again, but the ultimate test was yet to come. In 1566, the Dutch revolt began. For the next 80 years, Spain, the global superpower of its day, would rule the Netherlands with an iron fist. This wasn't a distant colonial administration. This was total war. The Spanish Empire controlled vast territories across Europe and the Americas. Spanish soldiers came from across the empire. Castilians, Aragonese, Italians, Germans, and even colonial troops from the New World. They built fortresses, established garrisons, and fought a brutal war of occupation. The war was devastating. Cities were besieged, populations fled, and entire regions were depopulated. The Siege of Leiden, the Spanish Fury in Antwerp, the brutal campaigns in the eastern provinces. This was demographic warfare on a scale the Netherlands had never seen. For decades, Spanish troops were garrisoned in Dutch cities. They built barracks, established administrative centers, and created a colonial apparatus designed to extract wealth and maintain control. Unlike the Romans, who ruled through local elites, the Spanish imposed direct military rule. You would expect this to leave a massive genetic legacy. The Spanish ruled not just politically but culturally. They imposed Catholicism, suppressed local languages, and attempted to transform Dutch society from the ground up. But here's where the story takes its most dramatic turn. When researchers conducted a comprehensive study of Dutch Y chromosomes, looking specifically for Spanish genetic markers, they found virtually nothing. The Spanish genetic contribution to the Dutch population is statistically undetectable. How is this possible? The answer lies in the nature of Spanish rule and the Dutch response. The Spanish garrison was small, isolated, and overwhelmingly male. They were professional soldiers, not settlers. 
More importantly, they were Catholic occupiers in an increasingly Protestant population. Religious differences created an almost impermeable barrier to intermarriage. Spanish soldiers might take local mistresses, but they rarely married local women. Local women who consorted with Spanish soldiers were often ostracized by their communities. The genetic isolation was almost complete. Moreover, the Dutch developed survival strategies that went beyond genetics. They created underground networks, hidden communities, and resistance cells that preserved their identity even under occupation. They didn't just survive the Spanish period. They emerged stronger and more unified than ever. The unbreakable code had survived its greatest test. But what does this mean for our understanding of human genetics and identity? So, what is the secret of Dutch DNA? The answer reveals a profound paradox about human genetics and identity. The people of the Netherlands are not a pure race. No such thing exists. They are a deep and ancient synthesis of at least three major human groups. The first hunters who survived the Ice Ages, the Anatolian farmers who brought agriculture, and the steppe warriors who forged the Bronze Age. But once that unique combination was forged 4,500 years ago, it created something unprecedented, a genetic identity so cohesive and resilient that it could withstand 4,000 years of war, invasion, and foreign rule in Europe's most violent crossroads. The secret isn't genetic purity, it's genetic resilience. The Dutch genome represents an optimal balance, diverse enough to be adaptive, unified enough to be cohesive, it's a genetic architecture that could absorb small amounts of foreign DNA without losing its core identity. But the fortress wasn't just genetic, it was cultural. The Dutch developed social mechanisms that could integrate newcomers without losing their essential character. They created economic systems that made cooperation more profitable than conquest. They developed technologies that made them valuable as allies rather than targets for replacement. Most importantly, they occupied a unique landscape that rewarded these strategies. The low-lying, flood-prone Netherlands required constant cooperation to survive. You couldn't simply conquer this land. You had to work with it. And that meant working with the people who understood it. The genetic fortress of the Dutch people wasn't built through isolation. It was built through selective integration. They absorbed what strengthened them and resisted what threatened their core identity. It's a lesson that resonates far beyond genetics into the very nature of human survival and adaptation. Today, as we grapple with questions of identity, migration, and cultural change, the story of Dutch DNA offers a different perspective. It shows us that identity isn't about genetic purity. It's about genetic resilience. It's not about excluding the foreign. It's about integrating it wisely. The Dutch people are living proof that the most open and contested lands can forge the most unbreakable identities. They survived Roman legions, Viking raids, and Spanish occupation not by shutting out the world, but by creating a genetic and cultural fortress flexible enough to bend without breaking. Their DNA tells a story not of where they came from, but of their incredible power to endure. In a world of constant change, the Dutch genome stands as a testament to the possibility of maintaining identity while embracing change, of being both rooted and adaptive, both local and cosmopolitan. The unbreakable code wasn't written in stone, it was written in the most flexible substance of all, the human capacity to adapt, integrate, and endure. And in that capacity, we find not just the secret of Dutch survival, but a blueprint for human resilience in an interconnected world. Sometimes, the most profound strength comes not from purity, but from the wisdom to know what to preserve and what to transform. The Dutch discovered this secret 4,500 years ago, and they've been living it ever since. Thanks for watching.